Welcome to Solution Focus World, and today we are talking with Dr. Adam Frohr. And Adam, how would you like to be introduced? I currently work as the Director of Research and Training um, for the Solution Focus Universe. Um, so I work closely with um, Elliot Connie, and by and large, I spend a lot of time doing a bunch of research, and I spend a lot of time doing a lot of teaching and training of Solution Focus Therapy. So. Why solution-focused brief therapy? When I was in my undergrad program, I was a, a psychology student, and I worked then in a an inpatient hospital for kids. So they were between the ages of six and ten, and we would work really in a behavioral process, um, and they would earn a bunch of points during the week, and if they earned enough points, then they could go home on the weekend. And one of the things that I noticed as we worked with those kids is that we would have phenomenal weeks and they would do well and we would see them improve. And, and then they would go home on the weekend and come back on Monday morning. And it felt like we were starting over, that they had kind of gone back to where they were when they started. And that is when I got interested in working with an entire system of, of people feeling like if I wanted to be helpful long-term, then we would need to be able to work with the system as a whole. So I went on then and got a master's degree in marriage and family therapy to learn how to work with the system. And that's where I got introduced to solution-focused brief therapy originally. And then after that, I went on to get a doctoral degree. And at that point, then I worked with Dr. Sarah Smock at the time, now Sarah Smock Jordan. And she and I, that's when we started really honing in on solution-focused work and particularly co-construction within solution-focused work. So we started looking at the language and how the language is constructed and how change occurs at that language level. So for me, it was the entry into solution focus was really a research entry um, kind of driven out of really wanting to know how, how do we be helpful for people and how do we help that change be long lasting. Do you use solution-focused thinking in your own life? Yeah, I would say that I do. I think that probably the way that I could describe that the best is I think solution-focused thinking is really a, primarily about how we view, I think, ourselves and also how we view people that we interact with. And I think solution-focused therapy, solution-focused thinking is really about about seeing the very best in people, um, assuming that they are capable, competent, strong, and then engaging with people from that perspective. And I think um, we also probably need to do that with ourselves. And so, so I probably the way that I see it in everyday life is with my own children. I have three children and really try to engage with each of them as though they're competent and capable and um, able to make good choices. So I, I hope it's impacting them in, in a worthwhile way. And when you started to use it with your own family, did you take more of like the Ben Furman skills approach when they were really little? Or did you start right off with the, the talk approach? Because my own interests and because I naturally am inclined to language and looking at language and studying language, then I think it just naturally came out in language. Um, but I think helping them to be able to articulate what, what the behaviors really were, look, were meaning, that one of the foundational principles of solution-focused brief therapy is honoring agency and autonomy, right? We don't, we try not to step over into the client's life or to tell them what to do or to, to give them direction or those kinds of things. And obviously as a parent, I can't do that wholehearted, right? I can't give no direction or else my job as a parent probably isn't very effective. But I think one of the things that I try to do is maximize agency, try to maximize autonomy whenever I possibly can let them have the choice and then let them also manage the consequences of their choices. Well, this might or might not go with that. What are the three most important things people should master as they learn to use solution-focused thinking? I think the first thing that I would say is master looking at people as competent, as capable. Um, I think oftentimes when people come into 
therapy, because that's kind of the realm that I work in, they're they're at one of their lowest points in life, right? They're really struggling. Things are difficult. And so through the conversation, they'll use language that will, in essence, try to convince you that they aren't capable or that they're flawed in some way. And I think we have to really honor that that, is, that they're in a very difficult place. But I think we also have to see through and find the version of the person who is capable, who is um well-suited for whatever they're going through, or that somebody who's capable of learning from what they're going through. And so I think that the way I guess I would summarize that is this, have a solution-focused vision. I would even go as far as to say, see people as amazing. So I think that's one thing I would say. The second thing I would say is get really, really good at language. So much of language is listening and you probably know, well, you've lived internationally. You've probably encountered people who speak all kinds of languages and so much of understanding what they need or what they want is in listening and then picking up those things and really honing in, clarifying what exactly are you saying so that we can be on the, the exact same page. And I think there are, there are language tools like formulations and grounding and presuppositions that if you, if you really work to learn about those things and incorporate those into your work, the actual therapy gets very, very easy because you, because you're listening and seeing them as amazing and then utilizing the language that they're utilizing. So I would say those are two things. I think the third thing I would say is know where you are in any given session. I think sometimes solution-focused therapists, they, they're really good at asking solution-focused questions, but not necessarily aimed at a specific outcome. And I think, I think one of the questions that I think is foundational to this approach is what are your best hopes, right? Um, what's the outcome that you're looking for? And then building each question in a way that's consistent with them achieving that outcome. I think sometimes we ask really good questions, but they're not targeted at what the client wants or where the client wants to be. And so I think making sure that your questions lead to where your client wants to be. Makes sense. Now, I, I've encountered many solution-focused brief therapists started in family system therapy, <laughs> like, like yourself, or um, at least many of the ones I've talked with. How do you feel that that influenced your current approach in use of solution-focused thinking and practice? I guess the way that I would say it is that it helps me to kind of hold a bigger perspective. Um, I think whether I'm sitting with one person or whether I'm sitting with multiple people, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't do me any good to think about this person as in a vacuum. I think one of the magical things about solution-focused therapy is that when you ask about what other people notice, people are able to articulate things that perhaps they wouldn't be able to articulate if they were looking at it from their own perspective. I think in addition to that, when we think about, when we ask people, what are your best hopes and we get what their desired outcomes are, a majority of the time, their desired outcome involves other people. Usually somebody will say like, I want to be more connected to, or I want to feel peace and security within my relationships. And so, so understanding that family systems perspective, it helps me to be able to ask questions that are pertinent to what the client wants. What fields beyond counseling do you feel best aligned with solution-focused thinking? I think anything can align with solution-focused thinking. I mean, obviously some of the easiest um, closely aligned that people work in and talk about and write about are coaching, executive coaching, those kinds of things, things in business schools, which I'm guessing is predominantly where you're using this. Uh, there's a lot of research now that says um, in medical arenas. So a lot of the literature is in nursing, but also there's a lot of literature that's coming out of China. That's just in like rehabilitation or dealing with, patients who are managing cancer. So I think really solution-focused thinking can apply to, to anything. I think it can, I think it can 
as long as you can articulate what you would like, where you would like to be, I think, I think solution focused thinking can be useful. Were there any moments when you felt solution focused brief therapy wasn't working for you? The answer really is no. There was a, there was a short period of time when I was in my, um, my doctoral program um, and that's where you really have to like articulate your thinking about this and you have to really delineate all of the pieces. And at that point, I started wondering, am I not understanding this? Am I not, is, am I the one who's off base? Am I the one who's not fitting here? Um, and so there was a time where I had to evaluate, can I really do this? Is, am I on, ba- on track? But um, that, was pro- that was also the time um, that w- it almost consi- coincided exactly with when I met Elliot and he and I started meeting each week and talking about it each week. And I realized his thinking and my thinking really did align. Um, and so I think that there are various kind of strains of solution focused therapy. Um, and I think sometimes you just have to find the pe- people who think um, like you think. So I wouldn't say that solution focus didn't fit. I would just say I just hadn't. I just hadn't found the people who were thinking like I was thinking. I find it fascinating how people can take the same general principles and put them together slightly differently. Like Mm -hmm. you guys are slightly different from brief and you're both, uh, both brief and you guys are different than Linda Metcalf. And then just seeing how everybody's putting it together, the same general ideas in in different patterns uh, to get good outcomes is, uh, I mean, to me, that shows that the overall philosophy works. I think that's true. Um, I think it does. I think so much of psychotherapy and I think just philosophical approach in general, it has to fit who we are as people. Um, and so I think it would be impossible for us to all kind of fit into one particular frame. So, If you had to come up with an advertising campaign for solution-focused brief therapy, what would your slogan be? Is my advertising campaign for clinicians or for a regular lay person? Oh, both. <laughs> you can either align them or do one of each. I was going to say, I probably would need to do one of each um, if that's the case. It would include something about hope because I think hope is one of the foundational principles. So it would probably be something like hope with a colon and then... Um, probably say something like, like build, building hope one question at a time or some, something along those lines. If I, if I were talking to a re- the regular lay audience, I would probably say build, build the life you want one description at a time or something like that. Is there anything that I've missed? Is there anything that you'd like to add? I guess just along along the research side, I think we're we're at a really interesting crossroads as far as um, research goes. Right there, we're in an era where um, they're really pushing the need for being able to fit into an evidence based approach, right, and having empirical evidence and and all of those kinds of things. And I think. On, on the one hand, that's, and again, this coming from our researcher, this, you're going to have to take all of this with a grain of salt. But I think that's a really valuable way to think about it, right? We need, we need to make sure that what we're doing is useful. We need to make sure that what we're doing actually works. I think the real value of this approach, and I would go as far as to say is of any approach, is really, um, it's only valuable if the person or the people that we're meeting with find it valuable. And so I think one of the things that I think is a a piece of evidence-based practice that we regularly overlook is that the definition of of evidence-based practice actually consists of three things. It consists of empirical evidence. That's one of the three things. The second is um, clinical expertise. So, I have to, I have to get really good at my craft. I have to work hard. I have to practice. I have to hone. I have to know it well enough that I can be proficient at it, um, no matter who sits across from me. But the third component is what they call client values. And I think 
solution focused therapy is really uniquely situated to understand what clients value to incorporate those values into the description that we that we build but i think sometimes when we talk about evidence based practice we hone in on what does the research what does the empirical evidence say and i think if we overlook that we're actually using this with a person um if we overlook that this is built based on what's important to that person then i would say that that what we're doing is no longer evidence based if we try to force somebody to fit into a particular approach or we force people to do it in a certain way then we're violating one of the three principles of an evidence based pro- process so i think for as much as i like research and as much as i want to know how it works and why it works i think really what is important in the end is really does our client find it valuable it's funny because uh, i haven't really I found a lot about different applications and different uh, and different twists, but I hadn't really thought about it from a research standpoint until the second in terms of the different applications and practices of solution focused thinking. Uh, like if you research Linda versus Elliot versus Evan versus mm-hmm. whoever else. When you have three different twists, are you getting accurate data to really compare apples to apples? Because they do have different. So, how do you get around that? I guess I have two answers to that. One is there is um, there's two different types of research. Well, there's lots of different types, but I'm going to narrow it down to two different types. Um, there's what we call process research. and the other is outcome research and oftentimes we put all of our eggs in the outcome basket right when you do this does it work but i think one of the things much of my work has focused on the process and that's actually delineating like what's happening um what's going on in the session and i think like what you're saying is is linda doing the same thing that evan is doing and is evan doing the same thing that elliot's doing and one of the things that we that's why i think elliot and i started describing things i guess that's a piece of why we started describing things in the diamond approach um because we we talked about how there are three things that people tend to do that are similar across different approaches basically and the first thing they do is they they get a desired outcome it doesn't seem to matter what kind of solution focused work happens they all start with what are you hoping to get out of this process and then usually in the middle they'll then describe the presence of that outcome in some way so we call that the description right sometimes you do the description by going into the future and you say if a miracle happened and your desired outcome showed up what would that look like other times you do a description by um by talking about the strengths the resources the resiliency right we call that resource talk um what do you have in you that makes you think you're the kind of person who could actually have that desired outcome sometimes we go back into the past right we look at exceptions times where the problem wasn't a problem and we and we say what was happening at that point that made it more likely that you were close to your desired outcome so the dis- the types of descriptions are different but in each of them they're describing the presence of the desired outcome um and then the third thing that people tend to do is then close in a way that's we say honors their agency and autonomy right we try to do as little as possible to say now go out and do such and such a thing or whatever right we leave it up to them to decide what to do so we have found some commonalities about the different approaches so i think we really need to hone in on what are people actually doing in the room is it the same is it different and then we need to connect that to two outcomes when they do these certain things does it impact the outcomes that people produce we there we just finished writing a paper um that is being reviewed right now so i can't give it to you or else i would give it to you but they're looking at it right now but one of the things that we did is we looked at um uh, mark mccurgo wrote a paper about 1.0 versus 2.0 solution focused brief therapy so we did a micro analysis of three 1.0 therapists steve insu and avon dolan and three 2.0 therapists Chris Iveson Evan George and Elliot and we compared how they use 
presuppositions. And one of the things that we noticed is that um, they do a lot of things the same, but there is, there is one really important thing that they do different. And you kind of highlighted it before in, in the brief approach, it's very much about just asking questions for people to describe. Whereas in 1.0, it was, it was based on building up to a task, right? Of trying to understand what was going well, trying to understand level of motivation. If you have a visitor, a complainant, those kinds of things, and then trying to give a task that's meaningful, that is not just an attempted solution, but, and by, by, doing those things differently, they need to use presuppositions differently. And we noticed that there is a significant difference in those two things. Um, and so I think that then brings it back to us as a field to say, so if there are differences, what do we want to do about it? How do we want to talk about it? How do we, I don't think that that means that we're not under the same umbrella. Um, but I think it does mean that we need to be really clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it.